Welcome to the Conversations That Matter podcast. My name is John Harris. I hope that everyone is getting into what we refer to as the holiday spirit, or I like to say the Christmas spirit, because that is the holiday that we are actually celebrating. It is the holy day uh, of Christ's birth uh, when we celebrate it, uh, the advent of God coming into the temporal realm. Have you thought about that? That's such an amazing concept. It's just God, the God of the universe who created this place, entered into it. There, there's a line from a, a very old song. My parents used to play this um, Michael Card song. And it, it, he talks anyway about uh, a mother made by her own child in one of his songs. And it's just it's very profound when you think about it. Uh, but th- there is a Christmas spirit that um, is partially related to Advent, but also I think partially related to the season. Now, I can say that as someone who's in a very cold area right now, and it's getting colder. Uh, Maybe you don't feel that way if you're living in Florida or the Deep South or Southern California, but if you are in uh, the North or the Midwest, then you know that there's a big seasonal change. And so with that seasonal change, there's a lot of habits, uh, a lot of things that obviously, I think this actually goes for the Deep South now, obviously everyone's uh, drinking certain beverages, right? Hot chocolate. Um, people are dressing even a little differently. The styles change. Even in warm areas, so the styles change. Uh, watching different kinds of movies and listening to different kinds of music and perhaps reading different kinds of books. I know one of my favorite books to read, and, and I've done this now two or three years, no, three years I think at least, is a book by Washington Irving called Old Christmas. And I've thought actually about doing some live readings of it on on the podcast just because I think it's so good (laughs) but you can get it on audible I mean you don't have to hear me reading it but I just thought I had this vision in my head of uh, a Christmas tree and a blanket and some hot cocoa and a fire going and we're going to read some old Christmas I don't know if people would be interested in that comment if you're interested in some old Christmas one of my favorite it it is my favorite let's just be honest it is my favorite Christmas book uh, then I will I, I will make it happen somehow but Anyway, there's just a lot of things that change just because the season's changing as well. And so growing up in that, you associate that with Advent and it it just the the mixture of those things and what and how all of society just tends to. And it's less so now, I know, but they still uh, tend to go along with these habits, these traditions uh, of yore. (laughs) They they um, listen to Bing Crosby and Gene Autry uh, and Nat King Cole. When else do they listen to those people? They don't even know who those people are, but they're listening to them at Christmas time. And there's a connection to the past. And and that's what society is. It's not just a, a fellowship of people that are presently alive. It's a communion with the past and with the future. Uh, that's what a society is. And I think it's keenly felt more so during this time of year. So anyway, that's my little spiel about Christmas and the Christmas spirit. Um, generosity, uh, obviously though, the centerpiece of all of it is the, the fact that Christ came into this world. God became man. And, and in order to do what? In order to save mankind, to do the will of his father, which was to save those who would repent and believe in him. And he went through a great amount of pain. And we think about that more uh, on Good Friday, but Christmas was, um, it, it was the start of that. It got the ball rolling, right? The advent. And so um, it's connected to this larger story of redemption that I just, uh, uh, I, I cherish and we all cherish as believers. And so this is a special time. And even in a secularized society, let's just be honest, it's not even secularized as much as it is a pagan society. Uh, there's still somewhat of a place, somewhat of an exemption given during this time of year. It was it was interesting. I was even... Um, there was something on, on the television, uh, not not live TV. It was I'm trying to think what it was. Now it was a uh, some Marvel thing that was on the screen. Anyway, Hawkeye. I think it was called Hawkeye. And there there was uh, there, there's a few times in that, and it's a very brand new Disney Channel. But and I don't endorse Disney. I'm not saying give to Disney Plus. I'm not. I don't. I don't have a subscription to Disney or Disney Plus. And I'm not saying to watch Hawkeye. Just for everyone who's uh, concerned about that, perhaps. But I happen to see this, that even in this Disney uh, show, he's saying Merry Christmas, the, their main character. I just thought that was interesting. So there's still kind of an exemption made, even in the secular world, for Christmas. 
So we're going to talk about um, not that, but I wanted to just open with that because I'm feeling it. I'm, I'm just getting into that mood. And despite uh, whatever variants are are supposed to be freaking us out right now, uh, it's Omicron now. Who knows what it'll be next year? Uh, there's still a place for joy, for uh, getting together with other people. And, you know, when you do get together, it's, it's not just an event. It is to affirm relationships, to build trust, uh, to show forth love to each other. I mean, these things, they happen this time of year more so. And I think it's just, it's a special time. And we can focus on that and not uh, what everyone would like to get us upset about. Now, on that note, I'm going to talk about something that, uh, that I, I don't want you to be upset about, but I want you to be aware of. How about that? We'll make that little distinction. Uh, because there, you know, we should perhaps there's a righteous anger, but we don't need to be on, you know, level ten of righteous anger all the time. In fact, there's there's times to chill, right? And I think this time is probably as good a time of any to to kind of chill. We need a break from that to some extent, but we do need to be aware of some things. And uh, there's been many things uh, behind the scenes, uh, even in my own personal life, this last week that has it, just really shown me so clearly how subversive the social justice religion is. And people you think that should be vetted, that should be fine, that should be um, totally um, not on that bandwagon because, hey, they're a member of a confessional reformed church or something. Uh, they are. <laughs> and uh, even friends that you might have had for a long time and you think, I'm going to reconnect. It's Christmas. I'm going to see them at a party. And wait, what happened to what happened to her? What happened to him? Uh, it's it, it, it's something that is um, it, it behaves as a religion and it, it's so subversive and people it, it's people don't just when they convert to a religion. Let me give you an example of what I'm about to say before I get into what I'm about to say. Uh, when people convert to Mormonism, I don't know if you've seen this. If you know someone in your family who's converted to Mormonism or in your friend group, they start mimicking the patterns laid down by Mormon elders and their church. And there's a way of talking. There's a tone. There's uh, certain words that they'll use. Uh, there's um, certain assumptions now they make about their life, certain actions that accompany that. There's a whole new paradigm shift going on when someone makes a true conversion to another religion. It's the same thing with social justice. I, and I've seen it over and over. I can. I, this is kind of weird. And I know some people are going to say, wait, John, how in the world? I, just trust me on this. I can tell 90% of the time, I can tell when someone's on that bandwagon. I just by I don't have to talk about politics with them. I don't have to talk about theology with them. I just have to talk to them about even the weather. Uh, and, and of course, it, it's not like a minute conversation. I mean, like if, if we're talking for probably, you know, 25 minutes or more, I can tell if someone a lot of the time now not there's there's times that i'm sure i'm wrong but and, I, and i'm not thinking through this in every conversation by any means uh so it's in fact more often than not i'm not even thinking about it but if i really you know want to 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 bring that the, those features that my brain has now been hardwired into because i've studied these people these social justice advocates for so long I just know their tendencies. I know the way they talk. I know the words they use. I know the way they try to relate to one another. Even the ways, because because I was at Southeastern for a while, and and to some extent at Liberty, even the ways the hardcore lefty guys and girls, um, the way they look at you, the way the, the, they're uh, the way I don't know. There's just so many little things, and when someone converts into it, it just changes so much, and uh, and and it's more. It could be subtle. It could be you know over time. They, the people that get sucked into this end up become behaving more and more like a social justice warrior would. But there, there's a specific variety of social justice advocate in evangelicalism that 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 person, I, I just I can just spot it. I don't know what else to tell you. I just when I see it, I, I know it. I can't even fully describe it. But there there are some features I can pull out. Uh, sometimes it's it, to some extent it's tone. It's the, it, it, there's a way of relating, which is just very, um, very, very at arm's length, very uh, kind of seeing oneself as kind of transcending uh, categories, usually political, but it doesn't even have to be political. It's very, uh, they see themselves as, as, as observers and, and very um, astute observers usually. 
uh, very, so there's sort of a judgmental ism, but also, but they judge against people who they think are judgmental. So it's very interesting, but there, there's that, there's a, um, uh, j just a wanting to kind of be the hero when the situations don't even call for a hero necessarily. So th microaggressions and things that just aren't even really big issues, they'll try to make into bigger issues and then position themselves to be the good guys. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I could just sit here probably all day and just think of facet after facet of like, this is, you know, who I'm talking about. This is the kind of person that when, when they convert and I've seen it, I've seen people go from uh, political conservatives, theological conservatives to woke, and they just start mimicking these tendencies. And one of them is this, one of them is they lose oftentimes if it, 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 it's over time, it depends where they're at in this spectrum because there is a spectrum but they eventually kind of lose the ability to really repent of of sin they just they're not they don't do it really and and so i want to talk about that a little so here's what we're going to talk about today evangelical elites don't apologize <laughs> they just don't uh and i can say social justice advocates in evangelicalism i'm saying it's the same thing in my mind they, they mimic the elites but the elites are the ones setting the tone here the giving the example they don't apologize and there's so many examples of this i think of even southeastern where i went uh when they were uh called on the carpet for the kern family foundation uh funding the oikonomy and network and bringing in programs they literally have a uh, ethics and so or what's it called justice and social ethics or something like that program it's a social justice program they have courses uh on racism and the environment etc uh they they just took the kern family foundation logo and name off of their uh their intersect project which is where kern was funding well, one of the things kern was funding through oikonomia they took out uh, a number of the kingdom diversity videos, lectures, uh, blogs, uh, when the spotlight was shined on them without any explanation. Al Moore just did this recently. Just boom, poof, where, where's all Jarvis Williams lectures at, uh, South, uh, at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary? They're gone. Where did they go? And so th this is a problem that I've seen over and over. And those are just two examples that I, that I have some... Uh, more, I guess, knowledge of, but th there are many others. And I'm going to give you just a few within the last few days, within the last few days, well, the last few weeks that illustrate this point. And so I'm going to draw a few points from it, but this is one of the characteristics. When someone starts to go woke, they lose this capacity to do true repentance, true apologies. Oh, they apologize. All right. For all kinds of things, which they are not responsible for. Isn't that convenient? It, it the sin that they apologize for in their minds, it's not, it's not even sin, it's just something they call a sin. It's the sin of the crowd. It's the sin of others. It's the sin of their ancestors. It's the sin of, of God, if they were born with a certain pigmentation in their skin or something. They, they apologize for everyone else's problems that are manifested within them, but it's not really their fault. In fact, they are separating themselves from the sins that uh, they condemn by, but that's actually the purpose of their apology. The, the apology's purpose, uh, which this goes into the virtue signal, it's not about actually making a, a wrong right. It's not about getting right with your brother or sister. It's not about true reconciliation. It's not about expiation. It's not about um, uh, trying to actually uh, figure out what you owe someone because you've done them wrong and then pay it. It's about... Uh, fundamentally transforming the country, the church, whatever institution they're a part of, and blaming others. It's a mirror. It's, a, it's actually, it, it's a defense mechanism uh, that they use. It's actually more than that. It's an attack mechanism they use that they, th that when the social justice train comes to their house and says, how have you been fighting racism or sexism? They put up the mirror and they reflect it back onto someone else. It, it's my culture. It's my skin. It's my parents. It's it's all these other things, but they apologize for it anyway. I'm sorry for my white privilege. I'm sorry for it. Well, that's not something you don't have any say in how, where you were born or who you are. These are things you can't change. 
these are things uh, normally that, that they're just part of your culture and they're not sinful things in your culture. They're things that you've inherited even sometimes, whether that's genetically or that's traditions. You've inherited these things and you're apologizing for things that you've been given. You're not thankful for even those things. You don't, you don't see those things as uh, the things that God has put in your life, in his providence, to steward. Instead, you see them as curses, which you must distance yourself from. So there's no personal responsibility taken in a leftist apology. So I want to show you uh, some, some examples, at least within the past few weeks, of evangelical institutions uh, not apologizing, not repenting, but changing their actions so as to avoid the ire of those on the right theologically and politically. To avoid pressure coming from the right, they change a little bit of what they do. Now, when the left puts pressure, it's like you, you have to you know, come crawling to them. And you, know, you have to show this, this position of humility and you have to apologize. Again, it's not a real apology. Even that, that's not a real apology. I've just been describing what that is. It's a virtue signal. But when the right puts pressure on you and you're a social justice advocate and it's too much pressure, it's just you, you know you have to do something about this, what you, you, you save your pride because, because in order to apologize, you'd have to admit that the conservatives are correct, right? So, so back up a step. If you apologize to the left, you do a virtue signal if you're a social justice advocate. You admit, you, what you're doing is you're admitting that the left is correct in their assessment of society and you were complicit in whatever crime they say you're complicit in, but you don't ever take personal responsibility. You say you are, but it's it's the guilt of the crowd, of your ancestors. That's, that's what you do. And you join the revolution. When the right comes to you and says, we're going to defund you, or we're going to put pressure on you to fire someone that you've hired who's woke or something like that then what you do if you're a social justice advocate and you, and you are forced into a position of having to get rid of someone or to take to, to, to retract something, you don't admit you're wrong. You don't apologize because that would force you to admit that the conservatives were always correct and that and, and it would force you in a position of personal responsibility that you've you can't pass it off to anyone else. You were wrong. You made a mistake. There's, and the conservatives don't let you get away with that because they're not after that. The left is only after you being part of the revolution. They don't want a real apology. Conservatives want an actual apology. They, they're under this naive and old-fashioned belief that you can actually get right with people. You can change your mind. You can change your direction. And you can uh, actually make things right, uh, whether that's financial or emotional or whatever it is. You can actually start on a path of building trust. That's what they're after. And that's where social justice advocates and elites and evangelical institutions can't go because they're not interested in actual apologies. So let's talk about the examples that I keep uh, mentioning here. Uh, first one is Dottie Lewis. Now, this is this is a little more tenuous uh, as far as, you know, was Dottie Lewis, was he taken out because of pressure put on uh, Send Network. And, and the answer to that question is, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I do know a lot of people closer to this situation have told me, yes, that's exactly what's going on. Dottie Lewis was um, in, he, he was in trouble, especially uh, with enemies within the church coming out. There's even a bigger spotlight put on Dottie Lewis because Dottie Lewis uh, corrupted the gospel and he brought in a false teaching and he brought in what he called the great requirement. You can go on YouTube, look at woke preacher clips where Dottie Lewis is talking about the great requirement. And that's part of the gospel somehow. Uh, so he mixes law and grace and social justice law at that man's law. Now, uh, this statement was put out there, I think a few weeks ago now, what, November, oh, well, maybe not. This is November 15th. So yeah, I guess it's, yeah, it is two weeks ago. Okay. So Dottie Lewis, uh, at the end of this year, Dottie Lewis, president of the North American Mission Board's church planning arm, Send Network, will transition from his position to devote himself to launching Boulevard, an initiative to empower disciple makers. So, so here's the thing. He's not actually, uh, they're presenting this as a, as a good thing that his work is done at Send Network. And he's going to Boulevard. And, you know, this looks like a demotion, but they're not portraying it that way. Boulevard is also apparently connected to NAM somehow, or at least to the SBC. 
uh, I've, I asked that question to some folks who knew more about this and they said, yes, it is. And there's another organization that Lewis is affiliated with, which is also linked to NAM. So it's not like he's out at NAM. It's not like they've kicked him to the curb. It's not like they fired him. Uh, it's that uh, he's transitioning, right? Listen to these words as you hear them. He's transitioning. Now, in the movie Enemies Within the Church, there's a section three quarters of the way through it. And I should mention, if you want to see Enemies Within the Church, uh, you can go to the enemieswithinthechurch.com and type in the code. Oh, I was about to say the code. If you are a patron, you can type in a certain code. Uh, so patrons uh, can, uh, if you sign up to support what I'm doing on Patreon, there's a code you can type in. Uh, and it's it, it'll be right there um, in the um the uh, updates when you sign into Patreon. So five bucks a month, you can you can get 20% off Enemies Within the Church. Anyway, in Enemies Within the Church, uh, there's a section at three quarters of the way through where it talks about, I think they call it like something like the social justice shuffle or something. Anyway, uh, what they're describing is people like Dottie Lewis who get fired or let go, but they're not really fired or let go. That's not what, what it's, that, that may be what's happening, but that's not how it's portrayed. They're, and they're not really fired, like they're not on bad terms. They just, because of political pressure from the right, they have to get rid of the Marxists in their midst, and they just shuffle them around. They put them in another organization in their network. So they have buddies uh, at the Billy Graham Center or you know some other evangelical institution, and that's where they go to work. So it doesn't change a lot for them. Uh, and I, I actually, now I'm flooding. My mind is flooding with examples of this, of people who have done this. That, think of like even you know, like David Nasser, you know, and, and just there's just so many people that they're transitioning out. Well, yeah, either they, they were the ones who were kicked out or they decided to resign and it had something to do with political pressure or something. But they, they always put this smiley face on it like, well, we're, our work is done here and we're moving on to something else. And, and that's what you see here. But this is the thing I want you to notice. There's no acknowledgement of all the pressure that's been put on NAM and the SEND network because of Dottie Lewis from conservatives who are concerned that they have gone Marxist because Dottie Lewis is advocating Marxist ideology. Yes, it's not classical Marxism. Yes, I understand for all the nerds out there. The critical race junk. They, they're not going to acknowledge that. They're not going to apologize for it. They're not going to repent for it. They're going to celebrate this transition. They're going to act like this is the best thing since sliced bread. And that's how they operate. When they get caught with their cans in the cookie jar, they'll never admit their hand was ever in the cookie jar. Okay? James Merritt, same thing. We talked about this last week. Uh, Danny Aiken says, Today my dear friend James Merritt asked me to allow him to decline serving as a visiting professor at Southeastern, not wanting to be a distraction to the school. I have honored his request. His integrity, character, and love for the gospel is a model for us all, a great man and friend. And Rod Martin says, so Danny, let's, let, just for those who don't know, before I get into Rod Martin, Southeastern is a big Southern Baptist seminary. Danny Aiken's the president, and he was hiring this individual who used to be a president of the SBC, James Merritt, to, to visit, uh, be a visiting professor, but there was pressure put on uh, Danny Aiken and Southeastern because Dr. Merritt had in, just recently endorsed his sons, who, who was an open, open homosexual sermon that was terrible sermon. <laughs> they didn't even have the true gospel. Uh, he, he endorsed one of his son's sermons and said how great it was, how great he is at preaching. And then all sorts of other things started coming out about James Merritt from people even who knew him a long time. And Danny Aiken has to come out and say this. And so, you know, th this is how they operate, though. There is no, in fact, there's a doubling down. There's no apology. It's he has a love for the gospel. He's a model for us all. He's a great man. He has integrity and character. And this is a reflection. It's just putting a mirror up and saying, you know, you're going to criticize us. Boom, we're going to put the criticism right back on you. You're the ones, and he doesn't say this explicitly, but what conclusion are you to draw? James Merritt's not the problem. It's all those who criticized James Merritt, and it would become a distraction to the school. So that's the problem. You, we're still the problem. That's the issue. And so there's no repentance. There's no actual apology here. It's just we're going to put him away secretly, kind of. It's not secret. I mean, he's posting about it on Twitter, but it's, it's, it's kind of like we're not going to tell you the real reasons here other than it's a distraction to the school. Rod Martin says, so Danny, let's, let's uh, Merritt resign, just like Al Mohler let David Sills resign. What would it take to actually get fired? Murder? And this is a good question. 
there's people working at Southern Baptist institutions right now who have been very pro critical race theory and liberation theology. Why are they still working there? What, what does it take to get fired? Murder? That's what Rod Martin asks. What do you have to do? And he goes, oh, wait, I bet Bobby Lopez and Russell Fuller could answer that. And it's true. Bobby Lopez and Russell Fuller were fired. For what? Because they were too conservative, right? They, and, and the thing is, they all, they, they're so dishonest about how they portray this. Well, we were, we had to budget cut and get rid of Fuller. We had to, uh, and a number of other professors, by the way, who apparently voted conservatively, and then some of them turned around and kind of even threw Fuller under the bus. But at Southwestern, uh, we have the recordings of them explicitly saying why they were upset at Bobby Lopez. And, you know, you can't just go share your testimony about how you were saved from homosexuality. That's offending people at the ERLC. Uh, <clears throat> you got to get approval before you go and talk to people about, you, you know, homosexuality and your conversion and how you got out of that lifestyle. All right, now we have Salvation Army. Now, this is the one that's probably gotten the most press, right? Because it's a big organization. Uh, just recently, on November 27th, they retweeted Hugh Hewitt. Now, Hugh Hewitt has been a major disappointment to me. Hugh Hewitt is supposed to be a conservative talk show radio host. This is not the first time I've seen Hugh Hewitt just carry water for leftist stuff. Uh, th it's so disappointing. And I just wanted to mention, include this because it bothers me that he, Hugh Hewitt... We should not listen to Hugh Hewitt. He defends Salvation Army. Hey, they're not woke unless Christianity is woke, serving everyone in need, most especially the least and the lost, regardless of race, creed, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or any other measure of human being is a core mission of Army. Some critics of woke ideology are trying again to broaden their attacks to include everyone and including Salvation Army. It's absurd. Rather than grinding teeth, go ring a bell or contribute to a kettle online or on the street. The Army serves the most desperate people. Yeah, so it's not... Really? Really? <laughs> the... Uh, the, the, that's the criticism they're getting. They're getting criticized because they're feeding people. No, they're not. They're getting criticized because they put out a document that explicitly endorsed Kendi, explicitly endorsed D'Angelo, critical race theory. Uh, we went over this already. And Hugh Hewitt, no, they're not woke. Okay, all right. They even made a statement on the 25th before Hugh Hewitt wrote this, and Salvation Army retweeted Hugh Hewitt's comment. They made a statement d doubling down and defending themselves and saying they're not woke and people are just uh, making false claims about them. Well, guess what? Guess what just happened? Update. <laughs> Elements of the recently issued Let's Talk About Racism guide led some to believe we think they should apologize for the color of their skin or that Salvation Army has been abandoned, has abandoned its biblical beliefs for another philosophy or ideology. That was never our intention. So the guide has been removed for appropriate review. So they're losing money. Let me translate. They're losing money. And so they have to pull this. They have to get rid of the thing that everyone's talking about. The thing that they were fine with a few days ago, but now look, there's consequences. So what do they do? They, they, they bring it up for appropriate review. They don't apologize. Um, they don't repent. There's no admission of guilt. It's just poof. Never happened. It's not there. You can't find it. In fact, I noticed some other stuff on their website that seemed to be missing. They used to have a tab just a few days ago where you could go on their website and you could look and there was uh, like how they were supporting equality or something like that. They had some social justice tab right on their website. It's gone. I can't find it now. And I was like thinking to myself, well, that's just like the first thought I had. I was like, that's what Southeastern did. They, they These people seem to operate in the same way. And, and here's the thing. I, I want to say this to everyone. It's not wrong to get rid of something that you've posted. In fact, it's the right thing to do. In fact, that's what I think we want Salvation Army to do. Get rid of this stuff. But after so many people have seen it, look, it'd be one thing. If a few, let's say 10 people, 20 people had seen this document and one of them said, say, you know, you shouldn't put this up there. Oh, yeah, let's delete it. And, and they, they're not going to issue a big apology. That would draw more attention to something. But at this point, right, they've been caught with the hen in the cookie jar. And instead of admitting there's a problem, they're doubling down. And just like Southeastern, just just like uh, other organizations, they've decided to kind of blame everyone else for it. It's it's not their fault. They and, and it took consequences. It took financial hit them financially getting hit in the pocket to do this. So, what are the takeaways from this? One is 
they, these people are uh, driven by finances to some extent. You can actually bring about change by hitting the pocketbook. So that that's one thing. The second thing is that uh, these the people running these organizations need to be fired. These are not people who are honest, and they they have pride that's just through the window because they're not able to actually admit wrongdoing or apologize for anything. Um, it, it's just, it's sick to me that, that this is kind of where we're headed, that they have to be manipulated uh, in their minds, I guess. They're, they're manipulated by people on the right through the pocketbook instead of just the motivation to do the right thing. So, uh, so that's what's going on out there. Now, I wanted to bring, uh, let's bring some, some Bible into this, shall we? Because uh, it reminds me of a particular verse in Scripture uh, or passage, 2 Corinthians 7. We'll start in verse 8. Uh, For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, he's talking about his first letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that the letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. So Paul corrected the Corinthians, and now he's saying, hey, it caused you sorrow. I now rejoice, though, not... Uh, that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance uh, without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, what earnestness, earnestness, this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you, what vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment of wrong, in everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the offender, nor for the sake of the one offended, but that your earnestness on our behalf might be made known to you in the sight of God. Because of this, we have been comforted. Paul's comforted because they were sorry for their sin and they repented. But there's another kind of sorrow he talks about here. And, and it's not the sorrow that's godly sorrow. That's what we want. Uh, and it produces a, a boldness, a vindication, a lack of guilt. You don't have fear anymore. There's a zeal, right? You're, um, you, you're not going to be punished. Uh, but there is a kind of sorrow. There's a kind of worldly sorrow. So um, sorrow of the world is what we're seeing from the evangelical elites. Here's a commentary, Dr. Bob Butley. I don't agree with everything he says about theology, but he has he has some pretty good, in my opinion, user-friendly commentaries on the uh, New Testament and the Old Testament. And here is uh, some background info um, on the text I just read. Uh, the, the Apostle Paul uses the word sorrow, regret, and repentance. And Bob Utley says there are three very significant Greek terms in this passage to describe sorrow and repentance. The first, lupeo, is the general term for grief or distress. It is a theologically neutral term found twice in 2 Corinthians 7, three times in uh, 7, 9. So it, it's found in all these verses, uh, all over them. Uh, the term uh, regret, uh, metamelome, is found twice. Uh, and anyway, it's, it's, it's also found, and this seems to mean sorrow over the consequences of past acts. Uh, and then the last term, uh, metanoia, is extremely significant theologically. Literally, it means after mind. It not only involves a change of attitude, but a change of action. Examples of this type of repentance can be found in the King David and the Apostle Peter. So Paul is referring to... Um, to this painful letter he had written to the church at Corinth, he fully and truly expressed himself, but worried that the letter might cause overwhelming sorrow instead of a healthy repentance. So, so then he found out, no, it actually did the work it was supposed to do. He was very happy about this. Uh, but the sorrow of the world produces death. And this sentence has three key words that must be understood in context. Uh, sorrow. Uh, this verse contains all three Greek words for sorrow, regret, repentance. In this phrase, sorrow is lupeo, which means grief. Humans are sorry for past actions, um, but for selfish reasons. Uh, the world, this is a reference to human society organized and functioning apart from God. This is fallen humanity and then death. The use of this term is possibly purposefully am ambiguous. It refers to spiritual death and physical death. So here's, here's what I'm taking from this, why I read this to you. You can be very sorrowful in the sense that you can have a lot of grief. You can have emotions. You can have tears pouring out. And it may not be legitimate. doesn't mean it's not legitimate. It could be, but it may not be. And you could be sorry for selfish reasons. Sorry that you were caught. I mean, 
the evangelical elites can't even quite even approach this. They, but th there is some kind of a sorrow in the sense that they're, they, may, they probably, I mean, they probably regret making the statement they did at Salvation Army or Danny Aiken hiring uh, James Merritt. They probably regret that. But it's regretting it because of the consequences, not because they actually believe it was wrong. And that's the problem that we have. There needs to be lupeo, menomai, and metanoia. And there needs to be a change in action. Metanoia, change in action. So this is what we're not seeing, and this is what we need to look for and require and notice. That's not a legitimate apology. This isn't, I, I don't, I mean, I want you to be happy in a sense that, hey, look, some things, some good positive things happen, but not for the right reasons. And that's what I'm concerned about. And I've seen these institutions just go underground with the same things, pushing the same agendas. And it's just that they're not as public anymore. So in my opinion, it's game over. I wouldn't give to these institutions. I wouldn't go to these institutions. Look, if I'm a young seminarian, I, I want to go to seminary. I wouldn't go to Southeastern. I wouldn't do that over. Yeah, I went there at the time, but it wasn't the way it is now. Um, I check out some other schools and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe Mid-America would be a good place if you're Southern Baptist. Check into Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, maybe Southern Evangelical Seminary. Um, I noticed, I, last time I said that, some people got upset at me and, uh, and I, I wrote them back um, because they, so, some people thought that they, they were more on this Catholic bandwagon and I don't know. I'm not there. All I do know is the people I, I do know who are there, who are very reformed and very solid, um, seem to uh, to be able to operate there fine. And they say that they're taking a stand against the woke stuff. But here's the thing. No matter, there's no perfect seminary. Wherever you go, you're going to have issues. But it's, it really, the question is, what issues do you want? <laughs> what issues do you want? And uh, so there's, there's other places that I would just look into and see if there are options. Uh, if, and if there's other places that I would give my money uh, other than Salvation Army, you can give it to Samaritan's Purse. Um, I mean, I might even, uh, I haven't looked into them, but I might even give to Habitat for Humanity first. Now I'm afraid if I go to their website, I'll find the same junk. I hope not. Anyway, that's just my encouragement to you as you're giving during this Christmas season. A lot of us do give more charitably. Uh, just consider where, where that money's going. And, um, and, I, and take note of the organizations that have decided to double down on this stuff, and they don't have true sorrow leading to repentance. All right, that's all I got today. More coming uh, later in the week. God bless. Bye.